very briefly. Brothers and sisters, it gives us a great pleasure, a great honor today to have our uh, guest Katib for the Talim session. Uh, and first, uh, on behalf of Imam Rudolph Muhammad, who is traveling today, who would uh, ordinarily be taking on this, uh, this great responsibility and honor to introduce our, our speaker and guest Khatib. Uh, I do want to, first of all, uh, welcome each of, and every one of us to the uh, Talim this morning. He asked me to make sure that we did uh, get our speaker introduced and uh, get things rolling. So uh, with that said, uh, we are going to ask you to, uh, to be ready and stand ready. As many of us already know, uh, Imam Akil as well received and accepted in the community as an uh, uh, outstanding leader. And Imam, uh, he's also a very uh, talented speaker and a gifted writer, an author, um, as well as a chaplain. So many and all of the very duties that he has uh, taken on leadership responsibilities in, we're just absolutely honored and excited about him being our speaker for this morning with the outstanding topic that he will be undertaking for us, which is understanding Shahada. It's critical to us practicing our faith. So, inshallah, without further ado, we do want to bring you before you. So, uh, we'll, we'll defer here and give our good sister here, Sister Mia, an opportunity to come before us. Assalamu alaikum. I just want to take a, just a moment just to say that uh, uh, Imam Akil and I have been trying to get together for probably six, eight months. Uh, it just never landed on the third Sunday. So his schedule would allow him to come today and speak to us. I, w I was encouraging, especially the young people, uh, parents to bring out their young people to hear this wonderful topic on taking the Shahada. And uh, sometimes it's something I know when he and I, when we first talked about it, it was like a light went off. I, I told him, I said, this is something I was learning. It would light went off in his head and that he wanted to present this topic to us. So. Inshallah, I know that they are, they are taping it, so if you have somebody, especially young people that are not here, try to be sure that you stay and get a copy or find out how you can get a copy of today's talk by Imam Akhil. So if, like Brother uh, Zarif said, without any further ado, we want to introduce to you uh, Imam, uh, who is the new Imam of Master Omar. Uh, so we're glad to have him here today, Imam Akhil. With Allah's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer, we witness that God is one. We witness that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. And we witness that it is Allah and Allah alone that has joined together the hearts of the believers with love for one another. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ta'ala la sharika lah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan wa abduhu wa rasuluhu. Walhamdulillah alladhi ala Islam wa bayna qulubuhu mu'minun. Praise be to Allah. It is uh, an honor. It is a blessing. And I feel very comfortable being here this morning among family, among Muslim brothers and sisters. I thank uh, the sister who did the introduction and the other members of Masjid al Shura for the invitation. And I pray Allah that uh, we will treat the subject um, uh, adequately. The theme is understanding Shahada is critical to practicing the faith. Uh, the Shahada is considered to be the gateway to the faith. It is the foundation of our Islamic life and it is the gateway to entering the faith. And the proper word is Shahada Thayn. Uh, the root of it means to witness, and the suffix means twin or two. Um, the shahadatain is, uh, is a beginning for us when we enter al-Islam, and we have to make sure that we are looking at it as not being uh, the end. Frequently, once we have struggled through our life, went through whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
blessed us and caused us to go through and we finally come to Islam, we say, now I have made it. We take a deep breath and we sit down in the safety zone. But the Shahada is the beginning. After being off track, after wandering, after being in darkness and in doubt, when we take the Shahada, we are starting the race. We are at the beginning. And we have to consider that and keep that in mind so that we stay on the path, on the track, and we do not think that we have reached our goal. In the time of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the pagans had, each tribe had a god. Each one of them had their own tribal god. And they had taken the Kaaba that was erected. Allah says, Rafa, which means that they raised it up, that Prophet Ibrahim and Ishmael raised up. They had taken the Kaaba and filled it with 360 gods. And one of them they called the unknown god, just in case they had missed one. They had 359 statues and gods and idols in the Kaaba, and one of them was called the unknown god. At least we offend a god that exists that we don't know about. They were steeped in idolatry. They held the moon in high esteem. Each tribe had some aspect of nature that they held in high esteem. But the Arabs in particular, they held the moon in high esteem. They were aware of the fact that it had power over certain things on the earth. Here is a ball sitting in the heavens, 240,000 miles away, has a circumference of 10,104 miles, and it is controlling 139,685,000 square miles of water on the earth causing high and low tide. So powerful is the moon that it causes the baby in the womb of the mother to move in a circular motion once a month. The baby in the liquid, in the embryonic sac, is in water and it follows the power and the course of the moon. So they had good reason to look at this body and say, this is an awesome body. And even in their idolatry, which had covered over their humanity, somewhere underneath the surface, they still had this concept of morality. And it surfaced in this. If you made a promise to do something and you failed to do it, you had to enter your house through the back door for 30 days. One lunar calendar, when this became a question in front of the believers, they went to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat 189, and it says, they asked thee concerning the new moon, say, they are but signs to mark fixed periods of time in men's affairs and for pilgrimage. It is no virtue if you enter your houses through the back, it is a virtue if you fear Allah and enter your house through the proper door. My question, and it's a rhetorical question, is did we enter the house of Islam through the proper door? Once Islam came to the Hijaz through the Arabian Peninsula, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Say, he, Allah, is one. And it's called uh, uh, Surat, uh, surat al-Iklas. And Iklas means the purity, but it also means to clarify. So he purified the religious belief of the people, and he purified what they were doing. So just by telling them, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadan Rasulullah, the Shahada, just by giving them that, they abandoned their gods and became one ummah. So the shahada has the power of uniting humanity. This is the powerful shahada. Not simply something I stand up and utter in front of a few people. This shahada has global implications.
when we look at the Shahada, we also must remember that the Shahada is a reenactment of another act. When we take Shahada, we are raising our finger, and this is something that entered Islam through Bilal ibn Rabbah. We raise our finger today because of what he did laying on the ground in the hot desert with a stone on it. When you get to the point that you've been so beat down, when you get to the point that you've been so challenged by the society, when you get to the point you have exhausted your ability to respond to anything coming against you, and the only thing you know is, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. It's saying when you get down to everything, when we get down, as we used to say, to the nitty gritty, just raise your finger and let them know, whatever you're doing, whatever's going on, I'm holding on to this, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. It's a reenactment of when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went victoriously into Mecca. And he told them, go inside of the Kaaba and clean out all of those other illahs so that only Allah will be worshipped. When we take Shahada, when anyone takes Shahada, we are doing a reenactment of that act. We are saying inside of this Kaaba, inside of this house of worship, there is nothing that I will worship beside God. I have cleared everything out of my mind, out of my heart, out of my soul, and now there's no illah but Allah that will be worshiped in my life. The Shahada is a reenactment of that event. In order for us to properly approach the subject, we have to start at the beginning. We mentioned that the Shahada is properly called the Shahada Thain. And the suffix means twin or two. And most of us that have studied our religion, we can tell you very quickly that that's because we make two statements. The first statement is, la ilaha illallah. There is no God but God. And the second of the two-pronged statement is, Muhammadan Rasulullah. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. We say that is why it's called Shahadatain because of those two statements. You're halfway right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran Kareem in Surah 7, Ayat 172, this. When thy Lord drew forth from the children of Adam from their loins their descendants and made them testify concerning themselves, saying, am I not your Lord and cherisher who sustains you? And they said, yea, we do testify. And when you take your Quran and look at the actual Quran, the Arabic, the word they say there, yea, we do shahada. We do declare that you are God. When this verse was revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the companions went to him and asked him, what does this mean? And we have it on the authority you talk about chains of narration and good stuff. Sometimes we get a hadith and it's like a Volkswagen. Sometimes you get it and it's like caviar, it's like Lexus. You got top notch. This one is by is ver verified by both Bukhari and Muslim, but look who the person is that's doing the talking. It says that it was none other than Umar ibn al-Kitab. He said, I went to the Prophet of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, and asked him concerning the revelation of this surah. And he said this, the things that we have that are hadith that are also in the Quran, it's called hadith qudsi. It's verified. It has a foundation in the revelation that came to Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa and we have it in the hadith. And he told them this, my Lord has revealed that he took Adam and drew out from him every one of his descendants that would ever live and they stretched across the horizon. And Adam looked at them and said, my Lord, some of them have a light in their forehead. He said, those are the believers. He said, but some of them don't have any light at all. He said, those I created for the fire. He's saying, some of them have a bright light. He said, oh, those are the prophets. 
And what did they do? He said, Allah asked them, am I not your Lord? This is Adam. All of us out of him. Declaring what? Shahada. When? Yesterday, 10 years ago, a thousand, a hundred thousand? This is in the beginning. So it's called Shahada Tain because we did it before. We did it before. But he says in the Quran Kareem, he said, we found no firm resolution on Adam's part and he was forgetful. So we forgot that we did it before. So it's called Shahada Tain because it's a dual statement and because we did it before. How are we able to bear witness? Ashadu. It means to bear witness. Today I'm going to invite you not to abandon your logic, but to look at certain aspects through a different paradigm. When we say bear witness, we're not just saying, I bear witness. In the English language, to bear something means to carry it, to be responsible for it. When I say, when you say, I bear witness, I am saying, you are saying, I am carrying the responsibility and I'm doing it willingly. We say, I testify openly and without any reservation. I am willingly carrying this responsibility to be a shaheed, to be a witness bearer in my life to the rest of humanity that there is but one God. The shahada also is a unifier because it follows a vertical logic. When you say there is one God, that means there is one creation, which means that there's one creator that made this one creation, that means that there's one humanity, and it means that all of us are bound together in a global or universal relationship. You can go over here to uh, Walmart or Walgreens and get you some water in these bottles. And then water costing almost five dollars. And they tell you on the back of the bottle that they went to the Alps, the Swiss Alps, and the snow melted and they caught it before anything. And that's why you're paying so much. Or you could go somewhere else and they give you this special little bottle with the funny colors on it, it's twisted all around. It's a collector's item. When you can finish drinking the water, you can keep it as a collector's item. It's so fancy. But it's water in there. Or we can face the fact that there is on this planet one body of water that Allah uses the power of his son to draw up, condense in the clouds and rain back down. It's recycled and we are all drinking the same water. You can't go and get water from any other part of the universe and drink it, not on this planet. We are tied together by that. He says there are seven layers to the atmosphere. You can't breathe after you get up close to five, uh, five miles. Lower than that, three and a half miles. And if you're in China, the Chinese can't breathe more air than the Americans. Black can't breathe more air than the whites. The rich cannot breathe more air than the poor. There is one air that is filtered and circulated and we are tied together by that atmosphere. We all breathe the same air. If you look through the universe, if you're interested in astrology, astronomy, not astrology, astronomy, Hope you're not interested in astrology. Some of the planets, Jupiter, 12 moons. Saturn, nine moons. Mars, two moons. They're still finding moons around Neptune and Pluto. But on this planet, how many moons? Just one. Some of them are binary stars and they have two and three suns. On this planet, there is one sun. Allah is showing us, he said, I give you signs in nature and in yourself. So when we say, illallah, I bear witness there is no God but Allah. When we say Allah is one, everything in nature tells us we live on a planet that has one atmosphere, that has one water source. We live on a planet that has one moon and one sun. This shahada is powerful. It is indicative of the reality that we have to live under. I bear witness. I testify. If you had the fortunate or unfortunate situation where you ended up in court, 
as a witness, and they ask you to raise your hand, and we don't swear, we affirm. Do you solemnly affirm that what you're about to testify to, yes, I do. Where were you on the night of the 23rd? I was at home. Are you aware this crime took place downtown? Yes. How did you see it? If you're a witness, I didn't. What did you hear? Nothing. Why are you here? We got witnesses. This is the stand for the witnesses. What are you doing in the stand? If we say, I shall do, I bear witness, what is it in your life? What demonstrates to you? You are saying, with your finger extended, I bear witness there is no God but Allah. How do you know that? What have you seen? What have you heard? What do you know? I'm going to help you out. Some of us, we can answer that easily. We know where we came from. We know that it's a miracle that we are standing up clean, sober, decent human beings today. We got Shahada written all over us. I know what he brought me from. I know what he caused me to escape. We raised up in some of the worst parts of this country and come out sane, not in the insane asylum, not addicted to destructive things. I can bear witness. I don't know how many of you, I, I shadow a lie la I bear witness Allah's God. Don't have no bullet holes in you. Ain't cut and main. Ain't didn't lip in today. But should you be deficient in that area, let us help you out. Biologists explain to us that every time that a man uh, ejaculates, it's about 2.5 million cells. Fifty-seven percent of them die en route to the egg and mature. Of the balance, fifty percent of them are destroyed by the acidity in the canal they're traveling through. Only one under normal conditions can fertilize the egg. So if you and I are here today, we have overcome odds of 1 to 1.5 million just to get here. That's odds even the, the lottery can't even match. If we are here today, we have overcome the odds of 1 out of 2.5 million that we would make it here. The health department for the United States of America, the Surgeon General, they say that if you survive, your mother survived pregnancy and bring you here, you've already defied odds of one out of 100,000. One out of every person impregnated with a child will abort, have a fetus that is deformed or something. The odds of you being here like you are You've already overcome the odds of one out of 100,000. You see where I'm going? Then they say if you will reach adulthood in America, if you reach adulthood in America and you have not been hurt, maimed, or dismembered, you have overcome odds of one out of 10,000. They have kids just going down the street on a bike, bam, getting knocked off the bike. Two kids playing and one pull out something and stab the other one. One of them fall down a hill and break his leg. If you have avoided all of those things, do you see what Allah is showing us in our own life? I can bear witness that when I had no control over the circumstances, when I had no control over my life, when I had no control over anything, Allah was guiding and protecting me. I shut up la ilaha illallah. And then we can get personal. When there was no way for us to get out of what we were stuck in. Some of us were sitting in prison cells. Others sitting in rehab centers, going to AA, CA, BA, EDF, all the rest of them they got. Some of us so locked into a gang we thought we would never get out. We're going to have to kill somebody or be killed. 
about to lose our brain. Sister got a man, think he's a good brother, a good husband and stuff, find out she married to a lunatic. Mm -hmm. Trying to figure out how am I get out of here and save my kids. I get out the back door, out the window, call help, what? Brother got a wife, she says she's going to be a Muslim and come out, she's a hip hopper. Mm -hmm. Every time she go out of the house, she want to she dress like the hip hoppers. How do I get out of there? How do I get myself into this? We see circumstances in our life and we look how Allah guided us. And we say, a shadow of la ilaha illallah. Only Allah could have did this and I bear witness that Allah is God. The Shahada is actually embodied in the concept of <clears throat> Tawheed. The very first principle of Tawheed is what? The concept of Tawheed is what? Unity of God. So when we say, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, what are we saying? We are espousing the concept of Tawheed. That God is one. <clears throat> but so pervasive is the Shahada that it is actually in every one of the principles of our religion. Some say five, others say six. The belief in Allah, in the angels, in the scriptures, in the prophets, in the day of judgment, in the, 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 the divine law, some call it predestination. Each one of those has at its core the Shahada. Why am I charitable to you? Because I'm just a good brother with a big heart? No, because I believe la ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. Why do I pray? Because I just feel overwhelmed with the gratitude? Because la ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. Why do I fast? Allah says in the Quran, fasting is for me. Of all the things that man does, he says, fasting is for me. So why do I do it? Because la ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. When I get ready to make my trip to Hajj, I won't be taking the carnival cruise. It won't be because I've just decided to finally take my wife and go on a cruise. I'll be going to the place that has been identified as representative of the collectiveness of the humanity, of our similarity and not our diversity, of our commonness under one God. I'll be going there because la ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. In order to get to the Shahada, we have to pass through the proper door. And the proper door is called informed consent. You cannot come into Islam except by informed consent. It means I have to be told what I'm entering into, and then I have to agree. Prophet Ibrahim, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, it says, Allah says of him, he said that he looked at the sun, the moon, the stars, and their interaction, and then he said, I will not worship them, I will worship the creator of them. And Allah uses a word there in the Arabic language, he said he reached a state called yaqeen, and yaqeen means certitude. He reached a state of certitude that Allah was God. What had happened? The nature around him, looking at the operation of the creation, told him something, it spoke to his mind. It gave him information. The sun came up regularly and set regularly. It was at a fixed point the same time almost every day. He saw regularity. He knew there was a power. There was an order in the creation. The stars never came out in the daytime and interfered and blocked out the sun. He saw there was an order to this creation. He knew that there was a sovereign behind this. He got information. And based on that information, he was able to consent to submit himself. So we come to Shahada through informed consent. Yaqeen, certitude, that's the goal of the Muslim. So the first condition of the Shahada is knowledge. And the second is certitude, Yaqeen. 
can somebody practice Islam if all they have been told is shahada? Let me couch that in this. The first thing we're supposed to do after we take shahada is go home and bathe ourselves and get clean on new clothes and put them on and make two rakas. How do I pray two rakas if you haven't told me about salah? How do I fast during Ramadan if you haven't told me about fasting? How do I know how to be charitable and give zakat or charity if you haven't told me? If you've only told me, raise your finger, Hope I don't step on any toes. I hope I step on your foot. If you have given somebody shahada and told him simply raise your finger and repeat after me. Ashadu illa ilaha illallah, ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Say that again, you are now Muslim. Yeah, right. Informed consent. If we did it and we did it out of ignorance, Allahu alam, Allah knows best. This religion is based on intellect and using the mind that God gave us. This is not something that we join simply because somebody tells us it's nice or we like the way they dress or we like the way they talk. This is the religion that is based on utilizing your rational mind. In Surah Al-Qamr, in the Quran, Allah says to Prophet Muhammad, to thee, Muhammad, we have revealed mature wisdom before we gave information to the people. People came to submission to God in Moses' time by watching him hit a stone and water gushes forth, by watching him hit the, the, the water and say bismillah and the sea parted. That is how they came. Prophet Esau ibn Maryam, how, Allah says he let him take clay and make the figure of a bird and say bismillah and it became a living bird. That's how they came. That's fantastic stuff. I'll follow somebody like that myself. As long as they follow the Quran and the Prophet. But he didn't give Prophet Muhammad وسلم, any of that. He said, the miracle in your life is the revelation of this book to one who said three times, I cannot read. And that I reveal to you mature wisdom. No longer is the appeal in this religion to the entertainment side. Somebody puts a lamb on an altar and says, Bismillah, and Allah sends a, a lightning and burns it up. And they say, ooh, that's fantastic. I got to follow him. Now it has to be rational because emotions subside. They rise and fall like the tide. And we know that because every 2,000 years, Allah had to raise up somebody else to tell them what he had told them before. They forgot it. They threw it behind their backs. They altered it. So when people come to this religion, they have to come through the proper door. A person has to understand that if they take shahada, the person that is responsible for inviting them in and opening the door for them has the obligation of explaining to them what Islam is. The imam, the amir, the good brother or good sister has the responsibility of telling them, you are about to embark on a new life. That's why we tell them when you get finished, go and take a shower. What is that? That is symbolic of cleaning yourself. And we tell them something that is so important. We tell them your life was like this board. It had all kinds of things on it. And when you take shahada, it is erased now. You're starting all over again. If you should fall dead right now after you take shahada, you're guaranteed the paradise because you have nothing left against you. We have, this is important information we got to give people. Why should I come into this religion with all the, the, the baggage that I had on me and you don't even explain to me that by coming in, I lose the baggage and I get a new lease on life? information, informed consent. Explain to me that because it's a vertical relationship, first I identify the fact that Allah is God. And then out of my gratitude, I have to show him that I am grateful. And I do that because he don't need nothing from me. I make my salat. 
and I am decent to others in the society, and I give charity for Allah's sake, and I fast for Allah's sake. <coughs> Explain this to the individual. This is the Shahada. You are doing something and it feels comfortable to you because you did it before. Explain it to them. It's called Shahada, but properly it's called Shahada Tain because there's two aspects to it. And also, based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 7, Ayat 172, you did this before. But like Father Adam, you forgot. You forgot. He says, we found no firm resolution on Adam's part. Why do we have to do this? Allah tells us, it's in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's in Ayat 256. No compulsion in the life. Let there be no compulsion. And then the very next ayat explains that. He says, because truth is clear from falsehood. Truth is knowledge and information, falsehood. He says in the Quran, Karim, he says, when truth comes, it knocks out falsehood's brains. I love that ayah. I could just see truth coming, and you just take it and say, oh, here it go. And you just, he said, hurl, we hurl truth against falsehood. And it knocked out falsehood's brain. Meaning falsehood makes no sense to the human being once the truth is given to them. Allah says to us again in the Quran in Surah 16, Ayat 111, one day every soul will come up struggling for itself and every soul will be recompensed for full actions and none will be done unjustly. Allah uh, explains to us repeatedly that every soul is responsible for its own doing. Again, if you believe or have been told that simply because you were born in a predominantly Islamic country, you don't have to take shahada? Wrong. If you believe or were told because your mother and your father are good Muslims and they raised you up and you've been going to Muslim school all your life, you don't have to take shahada? Wrong. Every soul will be held in pledge for its own actions. Every one of us has to make the declaration for ourselves. I don't care if your mother was a Muslim, your father, your granddaddy, your uncle, your aunts, and everybody in the town you came from. You and I will stand before Allah separately, individually. He said every soul will stand bare and alone. Each one of us, thank you, have to stand before Allah. Every one of us has to take shahada. When? When the child reaches the point that you've explained to them, what the shahada entails. They have to take shahada for themselves. Everyone. Allah says, and, uh, uh, it's in Holy Quran, it's in the, surah, the chapter in Tanah Muhammad. So no. So no. So no that there is no God save Allah and ask forgiveness for your sins. Repeatedly in the Quran, he says, no, no. Some things he tells us to believe, but you don't have to believe in what you can know. So know that Allah is God. How do I know? Look at me, look at you. When you are sitting in the quietness of your own life, in your own place, in your house, or in your car, or wherever you go for your quiet moment, look inside of yourself and explain to you how you survived everything that you went through and got to be where you are. And you take credit for it if you dare. Look at what you were in before. Look at what you have gone through. Look at all the opposition, people coming against you, backbiting, snickering, complaining, saying you can't do this, you can't achieve that, and Allah did it anyway. Got a shahada in every one of us. We should be, no wonder we take shahada twice every time we make salat. <laughs> Cause we got a shahada in between them two, them two prayers that we just made. We got some more to testify about. Between Fajr and Zuhr, nothing happened that I can take shahada twice again. Between Zuhr and Asa, nothing happened. I done seen enough. Drunk driver swerve, I was coming down the street in Overland Park. Driving late at night, coming home. I'm in the right-hand lane. 
I see some lights behind me and they're coming down the street and just an inspiration. And I'm not one of those people that say something told me. I don't believe something told me. I believe Allah. I, I believe something have a name. Allah guided me. I just moved over. And the, and the lane I moved into was a turn lane. Now I was stuck. I had to turn. And the car that was coming down behind me suddenly got brighter and faster and more and more. And he went straight past me and slammed right into the car in the intersection and knocked everything apart. I said, subhanAllah, Allah wa I see you, Allah. I see you working. I see you. So, dear believers, dear brothers and sisters, let us look at the Shahada through a new paradigm. Every prophet, every uh, messenger, every warner was sent to populations, whether they were small towns, big cities. And the message has always been the same. God is one. Humanity is one. This is the message of the Shahada. I declare there is one God, and he is the creator of everything, and he is in charge of everything. Therefore, there is one humanity. There is one goal and objective. That's why Allah says in the Quran, Kareem, strive all together, the nas, all together, as if in a race toward all that is good. And surely, Allah will bring you together in the end. You started off, and then you separated. He says, I created you as nations and tribes, that you may know each other, and then I'm going to bring you all together again. Why are you bringing us all a bit together again? Because you're one. You're one. But strive in your diversity, but understand who you're striving with. Tawheed is in our economic system. It's in our political system. It's in our social system. It's in our academic system. Tawheed is the root of the life that we live. Bearing witness that Allah is one, having reverence for him, and following the path, following the, 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 the example. He says the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fi Rasulullah he was with an In the Messenger of Allah, you have the most excellent example of how to live this life, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us look at it through a new paradigm. <coughs> And make sure that we understand that God consciousness or taqwa, tawheed, and shahada are entwined. And when we are fortunate enough to invite someone or re-invite ourselves to submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the uh, doorway of shahada, that we keep in mind it through informed consent, which means we have to keep studying and keep learning. You have to share with that individual what they're about to be engaged in, and not simply tell them, to go by rope or to parrot a statement and then tell them, now you are a Muslim. How? There are five duties I have and you've only told me one. I gotta pray? How do I do that? I gotta fast? When do I do that? I gotta give charity? How and where and when and why? And if I can afford I gotta make hajj? Where is that? How do I do that? We cannot leave people hanging, nor should we be left hanging in our own minds without filling in those blanks. Any questions? Good. Then I mean I don't have to say nothing else. Thank you again for your invitation. I pray a lot that um, I have covered the subject at least um, uh, to a, a good extent and expanded the mind, expanded your thinking, and your perception of what we're dealing with. I'm sure there are others that can add more to what I've said and take us even higher, expand it even more. But we start the process of this gateway to Islam, the Shahada. And I say and conclude as we did in the beginning, understanding Shahada is critical to living the life of the Muslim.